Now 31, here we are with our last example. So let's go ahead and find the inverse of this function. The first thing I want to do, let me clear out the stuff I had before. Um, I'll clear, I'll just turn this off right now. If you ever hover over the equal sign and hit enter, you can turn a function off. And let me put in my original. So we've got x plus three, I've got a rational function over x minus two. All right, so that is a function. It passes the vertical line test. It also passes the horizontal line test. I can see some kind of vertical asymptote here, and my guess is this is a horizontal asymptote. We'll check the algebra in just a moment, but that's what I'm seeing. So okay, it passes the vertical and horizontal line test. So that means the inverse function is going to exist. That's great. The first thing I would like to do is find the domain and range of my function. So let's take our original function and let's see if we can find its domain and its range. And I mention that because, again, for me, whenever I'm dealing with inverse functions, I like to know what the domain and range of my original are because then when I get to the domain and range of my inverse, they're gonna flip flop. All right, so for domain, I have a fraction, all right? I don't have a radical and I don't have a logarithm, but I do have a fraction. So I know for my domain that x minus two can't be zero, or I'm gonna have a problem at x equaling two. So let me throw that number out of the domain, okay? And that, that's consistent with what I saw in my graph. This is the vertical line x equaling two. I can see that as my vertical asymptote. So great. Okay, so with that, Let's see what the range is. Well, the range, I saw that horizontal asymptote, and if I remember back to a previous section in this chapter, section 5.6, all of one section ago, um, when we had a rational function like we do, and the degree in the numerator was the same as the degree in the denominator, we knew we were gonna have a horizontal asymptote, and the equation of that horizontal asymptote would always be y is equal to a number. Oops, let me write a horizontal asymptote. So I am going to have a horizontal asymptote, y equaling some number, and the number was always the ratio of the coefficients of the lead term in the numerator to the lead term in the denominator. And this just happens to be one over one, so my range, not my range, excuse me, my horizontal asymptote is the line y equaling one. And I can see from the graph, I, I don't cross through that line. You are allowed to cross horizontal and slant asymptotes, but I don't in this case. This is your basic one over x graph, just been shifted a little bit. And and you don't, you don't cross that horizontal asymptote. So we're gonna go negative infinity to one, and then one to infinity. All right, so there's my, my setup work that I like to get done when I'm going through these problems. And then let's, let's do it. So my function is, what, do we have x plus three over x minus two? And step one is always to replace the y's with the x's and the x's with the y's. So these two are gonna become y's, even though this is function notation, that is my y, right? So I'm gonna write an x. So here we go. We have x will be equal to y plus three over y minus two. And from here on in, my whole goal is to solve for this new y variable. I'm gonna go ahead and cross multiply. All right, so as I head to step two, let me cross multiply this. It looks like I have x times y minus two equaling y plus three. All right, so let's distribute a little. I have xy minus two x equaling y plus three. All right, let me go ahead and I'm gonna get all the y terms on one side and everything else on the other side. Because again, I wanna solve for y, so the only thing I care about isolating, I wanna get all the y terms on the left side of the equation and all the constants, even though one of them has a letter and it's still a constant as far as I'm concerned, over on this side. So here we go. I'm gonna have xy minus y equaling two x plus three. And then maybe you're starting to see I can factor out the y here. If I factor out the y, I've got y times x minus one, all right? Let me move this over here. The next thing I wanna do is divide both sides of this equation by x minus one. So I will have y being equal to two x plus three over x minus one. And that should be my inverse function. Let's check it out though. Let's make sure 
this is going along with what, oops, excuse me, x minus one, what we think should happen. And, and when I reference what we think should happen, did the domain and the range flip-flop? All right, so let's take a look at the range here. The range here was me giving one the boot, right? I booted one out from the um, range, and you see that you would have to boot one out from the domain here, because I still have a fraction. So if I was gonna talk about for the inverse function, the domain and the range, right? Here, in, in terms of the domain of the inverse function, I can't plug one in. So I would have to throw one out of my domain. That's consistent, right? The range of my original became the domain of my inverse. That's correct. Let's think about what this function would look like in terms of its end behavior. Again, I have a degree one in ratio to a degree one, right? So linear term on the numerator, linear term on the denominator. I'm gonna take the ratio of the coefficients of those terms. So the coefficient in the numerator is two. The coefficient in the denominator is one. So here, if I was gonna talk about the end behavior for my inverse function, I have a horizontal asymptote at y equaling two, which means I wanna throw two out of my range. And that is also consistent with what we threw out from the domain of the original function. So this is looking pretty good. I'm feeling solid about this. And let's take a look when I graph this function, let's graph the inverse with this as well. So I will protect that binomial with some parentheses. I will protect the denominator's binomial as well. So we had x minus one down here. I'm gonna go turn on y equals x. So I have all three of those graphing now. All right, there's my alleged inverse function. And let's see, do they look like mirror images? Sure do, right? This piece got reflected over here. That's good, right? This is a reflection over here. So I do see those mirror images along the line y equals x, which means my graph is matching my algebra, and I'm feeling pretty good about that. All right, so just to recap what we did in this section, right? we're able to find inverses of polynomial functions when they're invertible, meaning that they're one-to-one. -one. And then we've practiced a little bit more on how to restrict the, to the domain of a function, whether it's polynomial or radical or rational. But once we restrict that domain, make it one-to-one, -one, then we can go find the inverse. All right, so with that, we're gonna wrap up section 5.7 and I will see you in section 5.8. Thanks so much, bye.